I understood early on that every single decision I was going to make was going to have a consequence, whether it's a good consequence or a bad consequence. But every decision you're going to is going to have a consequence, no matter what it is. If I make a decision to pick up this phone, the consequence is that the phone is in my hand. If I make a decision to put the phone down, the consequence is that the phone is put down on top of this table. So every decision you make has a consequence. So I started to realize that at an early age and started to analyze every single potential consequence so that I could try to find a way to avert situations that were coming at me in that low level matrix, in that low frequency area. And I was able to find, weave my way out of there, you know, through that kind of thing. And I really, you know, it, you know, just going off of this quote, really, I mean, kind of really extrapolating on it, but it's a lot of the unseen things that are going on that you don't realize that you're, you're enabling or activating. A lot of us are activating and enabling a lot of things in our life without even realizing. These are the unseen things, unseen thoughts that you don't realize that are occurring every single moment that you are alive, every breath you take. Right now, we're both, we're breathing in and we're breathing out, but we're not acknowledging the fact that we're breathing in and breathing out because we it's a involuntary you know action supposedly something that just happens but when you begin to think about breathing in and breathing out you realize that you're both connected to something and disconnected from something simultaneously so these are the things that, you know we have to become more mindful of every single thing that we get involved with everything that we do everything that we think and through that method you can navigate through this matrix a lot easier <clears throat> So we're gonna talk real briefly about the Osirian initiation, the great work of the ancient mysteries and hence the philo uh, philosophic initiation was and still is for the seeker to provide, uh, to prove himself the truth of these teachings in the analysis of the Egyptian mysteries. By the light of our arcane knowledge, we find that the cornerstone of knowledge, which was actually a wisdom gained through initiation, had its foundation in certainty that the first great cause of existence itself was spirit that this first and only element was the soul and that this soul existed eternally and filled infinity. So basically this is saying that all that really truly does exist is spirit, which is a form of consciousness, a variation of consciousness. That's all that really is here. So I'm up here talking to you guys, but I'm really standing up here talking to myself, okay? And vice versa, when you're talking to somebody, you're talking to yourself. There's only one consciousness that exists, but if you can imagine a giant orb somewhere up in the top of the universe, for example, or whatever that means to you. And then imagine trillions and trillions of fingers coming out of it, almost like a gigantic octopus with unlimited amounts of legs. Each one of those legs is a piece of that same one soul, one piece, one consciousness that's now separated itself and come, decided to come down into the formation of an avatar body like this and inhabit it for the purpose of experiencing life subjectively from this perspective. Every single one of us is downloading consciousness into our avatar bodies and we are literally receiving a consistent stream of that on a, on a daily basis. Every single moment of your life, 24 hours a day, you're receiving. The brain does not create consciousness, it downloads it. Okay, The brain downloads consciousness. He who refuses to obey this law will be destroyed in the order of creation. The fiery particles of matter ascended. It was written that heaven is above to form the luminous bodies. The heavier bodies descended and ultimately separated into earth, seas, plants, animals, and finally into the entities which became men. This is the earth plane. is what we know as hell or the temporal. Temporal, not temporary, but temporal, meaning a t encased in time. The ever-changing and constantly suffering plane of existence it is below into which souls fall to gain wisdom and understanding by experiencing both joy and suffering from the eternal or cosmic. The soul preceded successive emanations of the spiritual third dimension. Uh, the soul preceded successive emanations of spiritual third density beings, more or less elevated according to their particular status of ascent or descent in the grand scale of the spiritual third uh, 3D kingdom. What it's saying here is basically. We're in a re reincarnation cycle. This is where uh, some of you may have heard me mention this book before, The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. It's a book which is really a scripture. It's not really even a book. It's The Gospel of the Holy Twelve with twelve spelled out, T-W-E-L-V-E. -E. There's a few of them, variations, but it's not really The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. But when Yeshua was 12 years old, he disappeared from the modern-day Bible. Where did he go? <laughs> Okay, that's right. He went to India. He went to Tibet. He went to Egypt. So if you go to Egypt, 
make sure you go to Coptic Cairo, okay? Coptic Cairo, there's a house there. The guide will take you to Jesus' house or Yeshua's house. Because Jesus, it's a fake name. That means hail Zeus. But Yeshua's house is still there where him and his mother lived, where he went there to study and learn what? The Egyptian mysteries. This is why in my book, if you're reading my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, when you start to analyze, I put side by side the words of Yeshua from the New Testament of the Bible and the words of Thoth the Atlantean from the land of Chem, you start to see the words are almost identical. So you start to realize that, wow, Yeshua is reciting what he learned at the Egyptian mystery schools. That's what he's saying. Everything that he's saying, anywhere where he's referenced as talking, can be backed up into the Emerald Tablets. The Bible was copied from the Enuma Elishan, the Seven Tablets of Creation, the Atra Asis Epic. That's the, those two are the most of the Old Testament. Uh, then you have the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is really the book of going forth by day. And there's a lot of really bad translations as well, but even going into the, 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 the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, the Mahabharata, um, you, the Indian Vedas uh, have, you know, there's some inspiration from there in the Bible, in, in Proverbs. Uh, I mean, just so much of it was just taken from old, old texts that already existed. Okay, so Osiris. Who is Osiris? Osiris is the first initiate, the first one to start the Egyptian mystery schools. Okay? Um, Osiris is always depicted as being green. You're never going to see him any other color. He's always green. Everywhere you look in Egypt, and I've been all over Egypt, up, down, I've been there. Every single temple, every ancient site you could think of, he's always green. Okay? Uh, I truly believe that his skin was green, just my personal opinion. There's blue beings. You know, we look at uh, the Indian gods, which were really, again, these Atlantean Anunnaki people. They were blue. And you had the green. You even had a blue Egyptian, Ra. Not Amun Ra, but the Ra. He was all, he was a blue god. Uh, maybe symbolizing blue blood, even. But these people were different colors. The further you go back in time, the more interesting the people looked on this planet. And how do we know this? The more bodies we dig up, we start finding gigantic, massive, elongated skulls that can't be made from skull binding. Why? Well, first of all, they only have one parietal plate, and human beings have two. Oops, one parietal plate's missing. That's the bad thing. So that means they're not human beings, at least Homo sapiens. They walk upright, they stand upright, they have their bipedal, bilateral organisms just like us, but they're not Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, and we found now tens of thousands of these around the planet. So there were a lot of interesting people on this planet in ancient times. There's records of different dwarf societies uh, and, and all just so many different things that just really are amazing. Uh, and so the further back you go, the more incredible the story becomes. And, all, and the law which regulates the movement of the planets is no more immutable than the law which regulates the material expressions of man. One of the greatest of all cosmic laws is that which is responsible for the formation of man as a material being. The main objective is to reveal the workings of the law which connect man to material and man to spiritual. The connecting link between the material man and the spiritual man is the intellectual man. For the mind partakes of both the material and immaterial qualities. The aspirant for higher knowledge must develop the intellectual side of his nature and so strengthen his will that is able to concentrate all powers of his being on and in the plane he desires. That's manifestation. The great search for light, life, and love only begins on the material plane. Carried into its ultimate, its final goal is complete oneness with the universal consciousness. The foundation in the material is the first step, then comes the higher goal of spiritual attainment. Concealed in the words of thought are many meanings that do not appear on the surface. Light of knowledge brought to bear upon these tablets will open many new fields for thought. Read and be wise, but only if the light of your own consciousness awakens the deep-seated understanding, which is an inherent quality of the soul. This is powerful stuff. This is Thoth opening his first initiate, initiation for his school, his, his, his mystery teachings, and letting, telling people that this information that I'm talking to and that I'm also leaving behind is so powerful, it's going to give you the power to literally manifest anything that you literally desire if you can reach these levels of consciousness. Uh, and the power that's in here is also comes with this a warning. Because no matter whatever you want good to bring into your life, you can also bring bad. 
these are th these things work in both ways, both polarities, yin and yang. So if you have a lot of bad things happening to you, you have to really sit down and begin to analyze what could be the root cause of this and stop looking externally to other people and blaming them. Start looking internally to yourself and figuring out what can I do to change this situation. But you have to understand all this is depending on your level of perception of, and your level of consciousness, how you elevate your mind. And if the fact that everybody's here right now, instead of out partying or having a good time or doing so many other things that you guys can be doing, including even making money to pay your bills, you're here. Not only are you here, but you paid to be here. So it's saying that you're willing to take the steps needed to get to the next level. You know, and this is, this is the kind of forward thinking that it takes. This is the kind of action that it takes to change the planet, to change the civilization. This world, I always tell people, you know, they always go, why are you putting all this stuff out there, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, why are you, why are you trying to link up with people who got money and millionaires? And why are you trying to be in corporations and do it? Why? I can't change the world sitting in a robe and slippers with a prepaid cell phone making posts on Instagram. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work, guys. <laughs> okay. that's, that's not gonna work. It takes action. You have to literally put forth the energy, the effort, the finances, and the action. And you gotta link up with power people and make power plays. You think I'm here hanging out with Damon Amy? He's a great guy, now that I met him. But I mean, this is a power guy. He's a power guy. No matter what anybody thinks of him, this guy is a power guy. He's, plugged, he's, he's manipulated the matrix from a very early age. He knows how to play all the different games and he put himself in power positions and he's plugged into a lot of power people. So you gotta realize, everybody knows somebody that you don't know. This is what Thoth knew. This is why he left the tablets behind. Did he, you know, when he dropped these tablets, he knew that 7.5 billion people weren't gonna read this in 2019, but I've read them, I've analyzed them, I've written about them. St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas has written about him, the Queen of Sheba, uh, you know, Sir, uh, Roger, Dr., uh, Dr. Michael Doriel, Roger Bacon, I mean, I could just keep, Isaac Newton, I could just keep going on and on. Now, who's studying these fam famous people? Now they're reading them, and now you're reading them, and then guess what happens? You're going to tell somebody else about them, and it keeps going on, and before you know it, billions of people have downloaded those consciousness. Every single one of your outfits, every color you have on, every piece of jewelry, every watch, the whole camera set, everything, every speck of dust on the floor, every piece of paper, every water bottle, everything that's in this room is permanently locked into my memory and available for recall. And not just any kind of recall, I'm talking about complete high detail recall. So what they did was they took, uh, did a case study on people, random people who volunteered for the case study and they split them in half. Some people they took them for a walk through a city, that's why I have this picture up, and some people, and the other people, they took them all for a walk through a city, but they took some people and they did, they did um, uh, what do you call it, they did, um, when they put you under uh, <laughs> hypnosis. hypnosis, they put them under hypnosis, and the other people, they didn't put them under hypnosis, so they asked the division of the people, half over here that didn't get hypnotized, what did you see, and they wrote down everything they saw, the people that were hypnotized, they said, give me everything you saw, it was almost three times the amount of information. Almost three times, just from being hypnotized. They were able to go and tap into the subconscious and they were able to pull up information. And the information was verifiable because it was in the city that they walked through. They were able to recall jewelry and windows, not only the jewelry, but what kind of watches they were. Conversations that they heard walking by people during, throughout the walk. And even signs of buildings and stores that they've never been in and never even thought about going into. They were, they, were, they were able to recall that information. So typically you're thinking, oh, they're looking for things to remember, but they were remembering things that they had no interest in whatsoever and didn't even realize that their minds were even downloading that information. Okay, that's the power of the mind. <clears throat> so every, everybody here, I'm sure I saw the movie The Matrix, just about everybody, okay? If you haven't seen that movie, you gotta go check it out. I saw it when it first came out, because I knew right away it was gonna be a metaphysical story just from the previews. A lot of the things that I saw in the preview of The Matrix, which was a long time ago, I was like, wow, this is how my mind thinks. So I had to go see an opening night. Amazing movie because it really exposed a lot of metaphysical information, a lot of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, a lot of spirituality, spiritual messages. So we're gonna talk about light. Light equals intelligence, okay? Light equals intelligence. Everything in this entire universe is made of light. This is where you're going to see a little overlap from New York. So, 
We're living in a light matrix. I'm not gonna go heavy to quantum holographic universe theory right now today, but just understand that at the smallest level, at the smallest particle, if you crash them together, you're gonna discover that the only thing that really exists in this whole third dimension is light. Light, the particles are only light slowed down to a specific frequency and then and that interact with consciousness. And that's what we get, the illusion of matter and solidity. Like I said before, 7.5 billion people on the planet, but if I take away all the empty space in between all the atoms of those 7.5 billion people, I can fit everyone into a sugar cube, okay? You gotta realize that. My hand is hitting this table, or is it not? My hand isn't hitting this table, my hand is repelling the table. Really what's happening is the electrons in my hand are repelling the electrons in this tabletop. If I can phase shift the atomic frequency of the atoms in my hand to the frequency of the atoms in this table, I would pass my hand right through this table as if it didn't even exist. Okay, so when you hear about things like beings walking through walls and things like that, in my mind, I could be wrong, but I think it's advanced technology. I think that some of these people have the capability of doing things like that. I think there's beings that can even phase shift their frequency and walk from one dimension into our dimension and then back again, and then back again. So I think that, um, uh, you know, it's nothing but light frequency, an understanding of how light frequencies truly work and how to manipulate them. So basically what quantum physics has now proven through a double slit experiment is that all that exists are electromagnetic waves. There is nothing solid until a consciousness interacts with a wave and collapses it into something we consider to be solid. And what this means is, while you guys are all here right now, your house, wherever you live, exists as a wave, a waveform. It doesn't exist as a solid structure until you look at it, until you look at it. And there's a frame by frame delay, which we'll go into a little bit there. We're, we're, in, we're not in real time, we're in lag time. We're actually a little bit behind. But everything exists as light. The first ever photograph of light, both as a particle and a wave, was just taken. This is from physics.org. So they finally discovered a way to take a photo right at the moment that an electromagnetic wave, which is light, by the way, all electromagnetic waves are light. Okay? They're all light. That's what electromagnetic, electromagnetism are waves of light. You can't see them with your eye because we only see a very small percentage of light. But if you had the capability of seeing in many bands of light, you'd be able to see trillions of waves flowing in us and through us and around us right now. Matter of fact, some of us would probably freak out because it could be a little horrifying to see other beings walking around at the same time in other light frequencies. Um, so as a human being, we, we exist both as solid matter and we also exist as a wave of light. You are literally a light being. Every single one of us is a light being. We are beings of light. Every atom in your body is nothing more than uh, a particle which has really started off as a wave which has been, now been slowed down to a what's considered to be a solid piece of matter. So the word of the week is electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum describes all wavelengths of light, both seen and unseen. Light is a wave alternating electric and magnetic fields. The propagation of light isn't much different than the waves crossing an ocean. Like any other wave, light has a few fundamental properties that describe it. One is its frequency, measured in hertz, which counts the number of waves that pass by a point in a second. Another closely related property is wavelength, the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next. These two attributes are inversely related. The larger uh, frequency, the, the larger the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, and vice versa. So we're literally, and I, well, I told somebody the other day, somebody said to me the other day, you know, well, you know, God, you know, you don't think God cares about us and God's not, you know, you know, if I pray to win my game, you don't think that God wants me to win a basketball game? And I was like, not really. In my opinion, the creator of this realm, of this third dimension, exists. I believe it because of the science, to me, proves in a creator. This is, all the ancient texts say we're living in a creation. I'm telling you that the method used to create it is a light matrix. That's the method used for the creation. Um, and I believe that from a higher perspective, if you look at a, a very nice, calm pond of water, and you take it, you're the creator, you drop a pebble in it, and you watch the ripples go out. And those ripples go out and they propagate out infinitely. And as they propagate, those ripples create circumstances. They create universes, galaxies, people, animals, alternate dimensions. They create problems and issues and love and light and hate and darkness and all these things. 
That's how I envision it in my personal way that I feel that I experience it and understanding it. And I believe that an infusion of that divine energy was put in here for us to be able to utilize it and figure out how we're going to access this divine energy and utilize it to not only send positive reinforcement back to the universal consciousness, consciousness but how are we going to be able to affect others and alternate the program. In other words, bend this program to our will. Can this program, will it run out on this consistent path? Or will, it, will there be um, different spots that pop up on the inside of this program that begin to reprogram and change what my initial wave functions were? I'm really curious to watch this play out. This is the visible spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. This is all we can see. I mean, that's limited. That's really, really limited. I mean, severely limited to the point where we have to have technology to see in other wavelengths of light. If any of you ever get a chance to get a, um, a multi-spectrum camcorder, I recommend you get one. Get a multi-spectrum camcorder, even or get an infrared, and just turn it on an open frame and just let it record the night sky, okay, for about four or five hours. And then go plug it into your TV or your computer and press play. You're gonna be amazed what you see, what you didn't see with your eyes, but what your technology saw for you. There's a lot of activity going on all around us on a consistent basis, mostly in the sky. Sorry for these flashing lights, they just uh, they didn't keep doing that. Visible light, the electromagnetic waves, your eyes detect visible light, oscillate between 400 and 790 terahertz. That's several hundred trillion times a second. The wavelengths are roughly the size of a large virus, which is about 390 to 750 nanometers. One nanometer equals one billionth of a meter. A meter is about 39 inches long. Our brain interprets the various wavelengths of light as different colors. Red as the longest wavelength and violet as the shortest. This is why when you look at uh, different uh, science programs dealing in space, you hear something called redshift. So this is how we can detect that a galaxy is moving towards us or away from us by the redshift. So if the redshift, depending on the color of the light coming from that galaxy, we can detect that it's moving away and we can detect that it's moving towards us if the color is moving towards blue to violet. So we know when we're headed for a collision or an aversion in that method. Right now, we can tell that the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards the Milky Way galaxy and in a few billion years we're going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. So this is going to be Milkometer soon, okay? Um, and I do say soon because in geological time scales, that's the blink of an eye. We only live for less than even that. Uh, you know, so it's really amazing. And a lot of people probably don't know that we are not from the Milky Way galaxy. We meaning this solar system. This solar system was dropped here. We are from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. That's where we're from. This is peer-reviewed science. Look it up. We were dropped into the Milky Way recently. We recently arrived here. Our solar system recently arrived here. We're at the exact intersection point where the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy intersects with the Milky Way. What happened was the Milky Way Galaxy collided with the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy a couple billion years ago, and we've been swallowing it up ever since. And the point where the two galaxies meet is right where our solar system and our sun is located. So we ourselves are aliens of this galaxy. Okay, we're, we're not even from here. And the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is still being absorbed by the Milky Way till this very day. It's not even done yet. It's going to take another couple billion years before it's fully absorbed into the Milky Way Galaxy. Because of as above, so below, you have these um, interactions between galaxies that don't cause a lot of damage because there's a lot of empty space. If you took every planet from Mercury all the way to um, Neptune and put them together where they were just touching each other and then put them between the Earth and the Moon, they'd all fit. Think about that. And Jupiter is like 1,300 Earths could fit inside of Jupiter. So think of how big that is and you can still put all those planets between the Earth and the Moon if you put them all you know, side by side. There's a lot of space, there's a lot of empty space in space, just like, the, just like there's a lot of empty space uh, between atoms.